Hello and welcome to my presentation for my capstone. I focus on examining student engagement levels during remote learning. So my name is Gertie Flagg. I am currently enrolled in the NTEL, New Teacher as Leader, Graduate Studies Program at Keene State College, and I am a Title I teacher in New Hampshire, mostly working with fifth grade students. The purpose of this study is twofold. One is to identify different methods of enhancing student engagement levels in remote learning, and two is to identify barriers to engagement to remote learning. So I really wanted to focus on how to improve remote learning as well as tackling those issues that students face to better prepare for remote learning. I had three research questions and they are right here. My first one was, what does engagement look like during remote learning lessons? So I really wanted to figure out how do I define that? What are the behaviors of a student that is engaged in a remote learning lesson? What are the behaviors of a student that is not engaged? My second question is, what are some of the most common conflicts that students face when it comes to remote learning? So again, to get a full picture, I really wanted to look at what problems students are facing so that when I was teaching a remote lesson, I could kind of prepare and help my students because if I know some of the issues that they're facing, I can try and help them so that they can participate and engage in, rem in remote learning lessons. And my third question is, what are the effects of low engagement on students and teachers? So in addition to kind of what remote learning is, I wanted to look at why is this an important issue? This is something that we have been dealing with for over a year now. I think it's a complete, it's a very relevant topic. And so I wanted part of my research to be, okay, let's talk about why we need to learn these things. The participants for my interviews were the four fifth grade teachers that I have been working with this year. The setting is the upper elementary school, so third through sixth grade, where I'm currently employed. My methodology, so for data collection, I conducted interviews, individual interviews with each of the fifth grade teachers, as well as my researcher's journal. For my validity, strategy, I chose triangulation. So I used my researcher's journal, my literature review, and I included member checks after my interviews. So this is an example of how my data collection process looks. It was many, many, many pages by the end. So I just included the first section of it. And what I did was I made one column for each of the research questions and then the follow-up questions like I asked them in the interview and then I went through and I compiled the big responses what each person was tr basically saying so I kind of summarized the results from my interviews and put them in each section so I was able to line them up and compare what each of the teachers were saying what I was seeing in my researcher's journal, as well as my literature review. And this really helped me kind of organize all of the information that I was collecting. And it made it very easy for me to just scroll through and write about everything later. So for my interviews, I first contacted them. And this was pretty easy because I was working with them. So when we would meet together, I asked them individually if they would be okay with helping me with my research study. Once they agreed, I drafted the consent forms and I sent them the questions through an email and we decided on a time and place to meet to do the interviews. And this took the longest time, I think, to actually set up the interviews because this time of the year was when we were transitioning from our hybrid model to our fully in-person model. So it was, there was a lot going on. So I made sure I had enough time to be flexible with the unpredictable nature that is the school year in a pandemic. Then I asked them the research, the interview questions. I followed up with member checks. So I, once I had the interviews completed, I transcribed them all and I sent them back to the teachers that I interviewed and I had them respond to me saying if they wanted to change anything and none of them said 
that they wanted to change anything. They just wrote back to me and said, this looks good. After the interviews, I put all of the information in my data collection. These are the interview questions. I use my three research questions and then I added some follow-ups. So under the first research question, my follow-up questions were, what does engagement mean to you in a remote learning setting? What are some strategies you have tried to engage students in remote lessons and how did they go? So this was really about me trying to figure out what they were doing in their classrooms because I was only seeing part of what they were doing. I did work with them closely throughout the year, but I was also curious to see what they had tried last year when remote learning first started. So it was really helpful to kind of get that bigger picture and see what other strategies I could be trying. And for the second question, the follow-up was, did students give you reasons as to why they didn't attend a remote lesson? And then if so, what were the reasons that they gave you? And this was really for me to help me kind of back up what I was reading in the literature. And the third question, the follow-up was, how does low engagement affect your teaching? So I was really interested in not just the kind of overview. I wanted to know, okay, what exactly does low engagement do to your teaching? How does it change your classroom? How does it change your planning? I wanted to know the details of how it was directly affecting the teacher in their teaching. My final question was, is there anything else that you would like to add? My researcher's journal. So I kept a daily log in a Microsoft Word document. I had it right on my work computer. I would fill it out every day. I would make notes about my planning. I would make notes about how the lesson went. I would make notes about things that I was observing. Sometimes I would add emails that I was getting from parents, from students, or from other teachers that related to my online work. Here's an example. This was one example of how a lesson went. So I would add lots of reflections every day. And this is so, so, so important because reflecting on what you're doing every day really keeps you on top of it. And it, it helped me personally to see, okay, this is what today was. And I was able to flip through and look at what, it, what was the other day like? What was the next day like? And so over time, I was able to see different trends. So I could say, okay, the past four lessons, this student has really struggled with addition. Okay, I've been trying this strategy. Maybe I can try something else. So it was really helpful for me to be aware of my teaching and what I was doing. I also was always trying to listen and observe what other teachers were saying. Sometimes it was positive, like in this case, and sometimes it was negative. And it that was just really for me to kind of look at, okay, what are the trends that are happening? What What's going on in the school and how are people reacting? Another example of this reflection, I did a travel project with the students. So they basically picked a country and had to plan a trip to that country where they had to book a flight and stick to a budget and book a hotel and all of these really detailed things. Each time I did this lesson, I separated it by each student, what country they had, and then notes about them in the lesson. And a final example, I would sometimes also put student work in, in my journal because it was really important for me to have that kind of visual of, okay, look at how this student is improving, look how this student is improving, okay, which students are advancing farther and which students need more help. And again, it was really a, a very reflective process for me. But it was also a really great reminder of, okay, yes, it seems like it's impossible right now, but there are students that are improving and it is working. And it was, it was a little bit of a morale booster for me because this year, I mean, for all teachers, has been very, very difficult. So it's always nice to have a little positive. So I'm going to break down my findings by research, interviews, and experience. And I'm going to look at each of the research questions and what I found. This slide is specifically talking about research. What did I read in the literature? I really found that engagement in a remote learning lesson means having your camera and microphone on and completing assignments on time. However, there was a lot of mixed 
responses about having the camera and microphone on. Half of the articles that I read made the case that students need to have their camera and microphone on to prove that they are there. But on the other hand, a lot of teachers and educators were saying it's not always possible for that to happen. It's not always the best situation for a student. So sometimes they just are either unable because they don't have a device with a camera and a microphone or they're very uncomfortable showing themselves on camera for a myriad of reasons. Some of those reasons are they have they don't like to stare at themselves all day on Zoom, much like adults. They don't want, you know, their peers to see their home. They don't want them to see a messy room or a crowded area or sometimes they don't want to hear the loud background that's happening. There's there's lots of different reasons that students are almost ashamed to have their cameras on. And so they feel like they have to keep it off. The most common conflicts that I was reading about in the literature were poor internet connection, lack of access to technology. So in some cases, some households had to share one device for multiple siblings, or some households didn't have any access to any technology whatsoever, either because they didn't have any to begin with, or that the school was unable to provide adequate technology to keep up with the remote learning, as well as income gaps. This was very, very frequent in the literature. A lot of the research that I found showed that the students that are wealthier have more access to technology and stable internet, and so they were able to keep up regularly with the work that the teachers were assigning and they had as well the trend showed that students in higher income households also had more of a support system at home so their parents were able to help them with their work more and keep them on track and on the other side the lower income households didn't have as much support typically because one or more parents had to be working and they were not able to stay at home with their children Finally, the effects of low engagement on students and teachers. We are still seeing the unfolding of the effects of this pandemic on the students and teachers because we are kind of still living through it. And it was it was difficult for me to find a lot of research on the effects of low engagement for that reason. So most of this question was answered from my personal experience as well as from my interviews. There was an article that I have cited in one of the last slides that talked about this and discussed how we really don't have enough information to really determine what those effects are long-term of, lo of the low engagement that we saw. However, other studies have shown that when students are out of school for an extended period of time, their academics do suffer. Now I'll be talking about the findings that I had for my interviews. So most of my interviews, they defined engagement in remote learning as showing up to Zoom, signing on to Google Classroom and completing what they can on their own, and responding to comments made by others in the Zoom, using the chat or speaking, it was not important to my interviewees that the students had their camera or chat on because they know their students and they know that not all of their students are able and comfortable to have the, the camera and microphone on all the time. So they want to be respectful of that. And so they really defined it as just being there and communicating in some way. A lot of the conflicts that I found after conducting the interviews were technological issues. However, this was more so the case in the previous year in 2020 because the school was not prepared at all to have to supply hundreds of students with Chromebooks and internet hotspots due to the rural location of the school. There was no preparation for that because I mean, we didn't know that it was going to happen and there just is not enough technology for all of the students. This year, 
after we were able to get more devices and more hotspots to students, the sharing of devices is not as big of an issue, but it still is a present barrier. Another huge conflict that students face is a lack of support system at home and that, that just the lack of intrinsic motivation of students. So they are trying to do the best they can, but they don't have someone at home sitting there telling them, you need to do this now. Let's work through this. Let me help you. You can't play video games until you're finished. So it's really a lack of that intrinsic motivation. They would much rather be playing video games if they're going to be staring at a screen for hours than sitting there trying to do an assignment that they're struggling with. And that was a huge issue that we saw. So far, the effects that we're seeing on students is there's a lot of academic and social gaps. So of course, when students are out of school, we know they're not getting that direct instruction face to face. And when that happens, because we already discussed, because I already shared, they have that lack of intrinsic motivation, they are not going out of their way to make sure that they are logging onto Google Classroom and doing everything that they can to stay on top of everything. So they are falling behind. And what's happening is teachers are having to redo a lot of their lessons. And if students are not completing those assignments in the Google Classroom, they are not prepared to start that unit in class. So they have to, the teachers are end up having to review and redo. When the teachers offer Zooms on Fridays, that was the way that it worked in our school. They were trying to make them really fun and do activities and games like a scavenger hunt or an escape room or something just really fun that the students would want to do. When only half of the class would attend the Zooms, they would show up on Monday and talk about, oh, did you see how so-and-so's cat was climbing all over the keyboard? And so not everyone was in the Zoom and not everyone knows what they're talking about. So that kind of, that causes a divide uh, between the students who were in the Zoom and the students who were not in the Zoom. From my, what I heard from my interviews, it's extremely frustrating to put in a lot of effort to get so little in return. So the teachers were working as hard as they possibly could to make these Zooms fun and create lessons that they thought the students would like. And the teachers felt very frustrated and a little, a little hurt that the students were either not completing the assignments at all, or they were complaining about them, or they were just kind of filling them in, but not really putting forth their best effort. And now I will be talking about my findings from my personal experience. So when I was teaching remote lessons, I defined engagement as actively participating in conversations. So that was either using the microphone or the chat to communicate with the rest of the group. So if I asked a question, they would type it in the chat. Or if someone else asked a question, they would type in the chat or they would raise their hand and answer my question when it was appropriate to do so. I also appreciated if they could have their video on if they were able to uncomfortable. Of course, I would never want to make a student feel uncomfortable and I never ever made it mandatory for students to have their video on because I know from my interviews, from my research, and just from talking with my students that they just don't feel comfortable having themselves on camera all the time. And that to me, it's, it's a part of building that relationship with your students where you want to make sure that they feel safe and comfortable with you. And so putting them out of their comfort zone like that would effectively make them uncomfortable and not want to return to my Zooms. Some of the most common conflicts that students were facing was definitely poor internet connection and that lack of intrinsic motivation to complete assignments fully and correctly. Whenever I assigned anything in the Google Classroom, a lot of the time I would not get anything back. Some of the time when I got it back, it was all correct and there was lots of effort and there was lots of detail, but still also a lot of the time I would get things turned in blank 
or three words instead of a full sentence or just a, a basically not the effort that I knew the students could give me. And the effects of this low engagement is for the students, it creates that academic and social gap. And again, for teachers, for me, it was really frustrating and honestly demoralizing to work so hard on lesson plans and then have students just not show up or not complete the assignment or complain about it or tell me that it's boring. And it's, it's, it's very, it was very, very hard to get that negative feedback. So as I mentioned before, this is a very new topic and there was not a ton of research directly related to remote learning and engagement levels. So what I suggest for future research is continue looking at student engagement levels in remote learning lessons. I think that remote learning is something that is going to continue to be quite prevalent in our school systems. So I think just continuing to examine that is going to be very important to see the full effects of this year and last year on the students in the long term. As well as looking at strategies to improve remote teaching, how to support students who don't have access to adequate technology, continuing to research the effects of remote learning on teachers, as well as the social emotional effects of low engagement on students. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to ask me.